What's up, guys? Today we're going to be talking about Chuching the Thousandfold Thought by R. Scott Baker. Okay, guys, so this is book number three in the Prince of Nothing trilogy. So there will be some minor spoilers for the first two books. But for those that want to know more about this trilogy, I'm just letting you know. Don't go nowhere. Buckle in, get comfy, because these videos are rather vague when it comes to, like, the spoilers. You know, there's a lot to this series, this trilogy. So trust me, everything I go into ain't gonna spoil. Not a bit. Alright? And for those that are hardcore and want more from me, just know that the spoiler video is right around the corner. Hopefully first weekend of next year. Alright, let's get into it. So in the Thousandfold Thought, we pick up right after the events of Warrior Prophet. So at this point, our holy war is beginning to become divided. Um, and also we know that we're under new leadership here, right? The men of the Tusk have basically at this point signed up and said, Kellis is our warrior prophet, and he will lead this holy war. Now, we know that doesn't sit well with some, and we know, this is like I said, we begin to see that division. We will see where Kellis has sent a carry Confis and the remnants of the um, Nanser army to Joktha, and he has also sent Nayor Skiotha to kind of oversee this whole thing because the Nanser army and Confis are to wait in Joktha for transport ships to go back to the Empire. Um, so basically what plays out from here um, is a game of cat and mouse between Nayor and Confis. Except for the fact that neither of those dudes are a mouse. They're both cats. Big old pissed off saber tooth cats. Now the remaining members of the Holy War will push forward from Karaskand to Shima. Now the funny thing is though that the Holy War, not only has it been divided, but it also barely resembles itself. In fact, the Holy War at this point is starting to look more like the heathen than the men of the tusk that once gathered back at moment. So if you've made it this far into these books, there's no doubt that you have about a million fucking questions. <laughs> but the good thing is, I really do feel like this push from Karaskand to Shima actually gives the reader a chance to learn some about these questions that have plagued them from the beginning. Um, you know, like one thing is the sorcery and the magic system of this world hasn't really been talked about too much. When we know of it, we've seen powerful displays of magic. But this, like, during this push towards Shima, and, you know, really between a Akamian and, and Kellis, we'll learn more about sorcery and just kind of like, you know, how it's conjured up, how, how it, like, I guess somewhat of the in and outs. I know I'm kind of tripping over my own tongue here because I'm trying to be careful what I talk about. But, so we will begin to see, like, you know, the sorcery begin to flesh out as well as we get, like, just really good insights to the history of Ierwa here. I think that's how you pronounce it, Ierwa. Um, man, along the way, we will see Esmanet reading the sagas because we have, you know, we found out that, you know, Kellis taught Esmanet how to read in book two. And really, we are watching the, you know, that harlot Esmanet raised up in status. You know, at this point, she's the, you know, the prophet consort and uh, she's read the sagas. And this gives the reader massive amounts of history, you know, into the non man, into the inkoroi. Uh, and it's just, it's really something that you, it might be a little confusing. It certainly was for me. I had to read it twice. But uh, the thing is, it's just great insight for the reader to finally have about some of these question mark things. Another thing that really helps flesh out things of the past for the reader is going to be this dream of Akamians. It's really Seswatha's dream, but it's a new one. It's one that we haven't really experienced yet as a reader throughout this trilogy. And once again, it's another one that you really got to focus and pay attention to. It is amazing, but it can get kind of confusing. But either way, this dream of Seswatha's of Akamians will once again really bring it, uh, the reader into the fold when it comes to the Enkoroi and a little bit of like the non-man as well as just the past and the history of some of these, you know, just like massively historical, you know, characters. So as we push forward in the Holy War, we will finally come to Shima. And now the assault on Shima is not such a straightforward one. If you've been reading these books, I mean, it's got, it only makes sense because 
all of these battles are bonkers. And Shima is no exception. It is chaotic calamity. It is on fire. That's it. It's a firefight. It's like a fantasy firefight from hell, baby. And it does jump perspectives a lot, so it can get kind of disoriented and confusing, but I felt like that just even added to it. Ugh. But then also, we will finally get to see the meeting of the Anasa Rimbers. We've been waiting. We've been watching Kellis since the prologue on his mission to find his father, and we will see that play out. And you know what? I can't go. I'm not going into it. Spoilers, guys. So one of the first things I want to get into is just like the feeling of the vibe, the feeling, the style of this book, because it really does feel very much like that continuation of the Warrior Prophet. I do think that Baker has done some things with the jumping of the perspectives um, to add tension. There's, so there's some thing, there's some like structure to this book that's a little bit different than Warrior Prophet, but it very much feels like those two books are one. And I would, you know, not the darkness that comes before feels like it's completely separate, but it does feel different than the other two, I would say. Um, personally, I loved all these books. Um, but I would say that because of this perspective jump um, in, towards the end, for me, like, I just want to break this down. For me, I loved it because when you have these big, lengthy chapters, everything's been going on pretty steady and similar throughout the trilogy. But then when you start getting down to the very end, and you get those fast perspective jumps, it creates fucking cliffhangers like left and right. And I understand that some people don't like this, but personally for me, like I said, all it did was raise the tension and I was on my seat. So good job. The next thing I really want to talk about is just the characters because there was a lot of characters throughout this trilogy um, and certainly going to be some moving into the next. But... The thing is, man, like I said, these characters are amazing. So fucking amazing. I've never read a book where when the perspectives jump, I felt so like in the other person's like mind or whatever. Like literally every time the perspective jumped, like that person was a good guy. <laughs> you know, kind of is what I'm saying. Like it's hard for me to say that anybody in this story is the good guy or the bad guy because when you get all those different perspectives, it just, it's not about, doesn't really feel like it's about good or evil. It's <laughs> like, it feels more like it's just about, you know, that this is the way that people been conditioned or the things have been conditioned and it's just the way that they're going to play out. And really all I'm trying to get at here is the fact that it's just... These amazing characters really are just, they're amazing because they're so uncompromising. They are who they would be if these people existed in this world, if that makes fucking sense. I know it's like, this is really, but Baker is really making me work. I'll tell you that, guys. My fucking brain, everything. But I feel like he's paid me in dividends, especially with these goddamn characters, dude. I fucking cried in this book, okay? The characters are good. That's enough. Let's go on to the next. <laughs> there is actually one thing I would like to talk about because I feel like it's very much in these these books. It's in the story, and it's like, you know, a love story. There's like a—it kind of feels like there's like maybe a couple love stories going on throughout this book or this trilogy, but they are all brutal. They're— not gonna be necessarily happy ending love stories, but that doesn't mean that they're not fucking love stories, and I think that that's why I love them that much more. I know. Jesus Christ. You guys are probably not even gonna believe me. <laughs> Give up. But now, in all seriousness, guys, this book is amazing. This trilogy is amazing. We're talking about characters that will make you think, make you feel, right? We're talking about themes and concepts that will make you think, that will blow your mind. We're talking about religions that have such strong beliefs that they play through to the reader, and you can feel the breathing hatred between the Enrithi people and the Phanum people. Shit, you could feel it between the Enrithi people and any heathen. It is very well constructed. Probably the, nah, fuck it. It's the best fantasy that I have read. All right? I said it. It is. Now I know that that is a bold claim, but I feel safe and secure making it. But as it's kind of my job at this point as a reviewer, if I'm going to talk that much, you know, praise, I got to be critical and objective. 
And I do think that the thousandfold thought probably po- probably poses the most problems for readers out of the three books. Um, the pacing on it is fast, and it might be like kind of feel like it was rushed to some. I don't think so. I just feel like it's a lot of stuff that finally coming to a head. Um, the books will certainly be too dark for some. I know I made the snarky comment of, oh, I've read darker. But man, in Warrior Prophet and the Thousandfold Thought, man, Baker really kicked that darkness up a notch and it is dark and dastardly you're talking about just the worst kind of shit that could happen during war happening 24 7 so it's going to be too dark for some also that massive epic size guys like some people just don't want to handle that much stuff being thrown at them Um, and so that could be a con. Once again, this is all subjective, guys, because there are people that are looking for the darker tone, that are looking for the massive size, all that stuff. Um, I do think one of the big things that you'll see, um, even if, like, maybe from fans of the first two books, is they might, um, have issues, take up issue with the ending in this book. I think that this ending is a fucking amazing But I also have to admit, about 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have liked this ending. So it's definitely something I've grown into. I think that people that are like fans of, you know, maybe just not the happy endings. If you like the ending of First Law, I guarantee you, you can get on board with this one. Um, But that being said, there just certainly is going to be somebody or some people out there that are going to find, you know, have a problem with reading this much stuff and still having questions. Because that's kind of what I'm getting at. The Prince of Nothing trilogy, you know, kind of gives the reader all this stuff, you know, and the reader themselves will just begin to create all these questions like, what the fuck is this and this and this and this? And now throughout the trilogy, we finally get some answers here and there. But by the end, there are still some things that are very mysterious and some stuff that you thought might be getting touched on that that just didn't get touched on, you know, um... I'm trying to keep it really spoiler free here. I don't know. I feel like I already went a little too far about that, but I do think it's my responsibility because I think this is going to be the major issue with the book is the ending. Personally, I think it's gangster. I think that uh, the way that he like basically sets it up for the next series. So that's one thing I guess I'm trying to talk. You know what I'm saying? A whole bunch of words without saying the real thing is, you know, the ending of the trilogy feels more like the beginning of something else than really closure for a trilogy if that makes sense guys but like i said personally i fucking dug it and i can't wait to get into aspect emperor now as far as my two cents for the slow and the struggling the struggling reader you already know i told your ass to get in the reader gym buff up before hitting darkness but like i said in the last one once you are reader strong, um, yeah, man, you're going to create, once you get through darkness, Warrior Prophet and the Thousandfold Thought are going to be pretty easy for you, I think. I think the one, uh, the big problem with Thousandfold Thought is the strange stuff that happens. It's not so, like, straightforward. There are some mind-bending um, scenes, like so to speak, in here, and it's just, you might have to read them a couple times. I don't care if you're a struggling reader or a fucking the strongest reader in the world. Some of this stuff you need to pay attention to. Now, slow readers, I think that if you're looking for something that is adult, adult fantasy, I don't know if this is grimdark, even though it ch- it checks all the fucking boxes, but it is epic adult fantasy on a scale which I have never experienced. And I just... I'm going to say, yes, it's worth your time. Sure, there are going to be people that don't like it, but there are going to be people out there that fucking love it as much as I do. You know what I mean? I just want to go out the front door and start screaming about this shit. It, I, and I know that sounds probably kind of half bullcrap, but it's not, guys. I, I found my fantasy. You know what I mean? Like, I love the Broken Empire, and I felt really fell in love with the Manifest Illusion series, and those two are still very high, like, you know, on my, my personal pedestal. But I feel like I found something I've been looking for maybe ever since I started my fantasy journey, if that even makes sense. And the reason why I'm even saying any of this and just kind of, like, puking out my mouth here is I just... I think if you're that person, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and... 
It's for you, God damn it. Pick it up. Read it. Shout about it. Fuck, man. I really hope. I hope and I pray that other booktubers, ones with actual platforms, pick this book up, this trilogy up, because it deserves all the praise, all the spotlight um, that it can get. All right, guys. Thanks for spending some time down here at the channel. To our Scott Baker, I could do two thumbs up again. Aces. Man, you're a shooting star, homie. This is phenomenal. I don't even know what else to fucking say, so I'll just stop fucking talking. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there, guys. I know that these videos might uh, be a little bit gushy. Maybe they've been too vague and you didn't get enough. If that's the case, then I say get out there, read the fucking books, and then watch my spoiler videos. <laughs> All right. For those that are looking forward to the spoiler video, trust me, it's on the way, and I will try to keep it, you know, dialed in and uh, very informative. I know this vi this video, this fucking review was hard for me to do. It's hard for me to do, like, the ending book on this trilogy when I'm still, like, shitting my pants about it. I'm still fucking talking about it. God damn it. Okay. You know how it goes. All right. Thanks for stopping by. If you're new, please like and subscribe. You know what it is. Peace.